So let me cover the fine grain multi threading. This will be a nice input into SIMD machines. Fine grain multi threading is a beautiful idea, also, because it's going to keep the hardware simple but also complex. <laughs> Why simple? It's going to eliminate the dependency checking. Remember, how do you handle data dependencies? We said do something else. Meaning there's no need to detect the data dependencies, switch to something else. How do you handle control dependencies? If, you get to, if, if you're at a branch, don't try to figure out what's the next instruction. Just fetch an instruction that you know is independent from some other thread. That's the idea of fine-grained multi-threading. It's a beautiful idea. It's a very simple idea. It works when you have a lot of threads in the machine. And the idea is hardware has multiple thread contexts. You have multiple program counters, multiple register files, one for each thread. And each cycle, the fetch engine fetches from a different thread, every cycle. You never fetch from the same thread until the instruction of the thread gets out of the pipeline. So you only have one instruction from the same thread in the entire pipeline. Everything else is from different threads. You can see it over here, basically. For example, uh, this is the fetch stage. Uh, one, when one instruction is being fetched from stream three or thread three, another instruction, uh, it's fetching its operand in stream two, thread two. Uh, another instruction from thread one is executing. Another instruction from thread eight is executing. Another instruction from thread four is storing its result. And there is no single thread that has two instructions at the same time in the pipeline. Now, if you don't have two instructions from a single thread, there's no need to check for data dependencies within a thread. There's no need to predict branches because you're not going to fetch from this thread until the branch is resolved, right? It's beautiful. So by the time the fetch branch or instruction resolves, there's no instruction fetched from the same thread. Which means that another way of thinking about it is the latency of resolution of a branch or any instruction that produces data that's needed by some other instruction, that latency is overlapped with the execution of other threads instructions, independent stuff which means that there is no need for handling control and data dependencies within a thread. That's beautiful, you got rid of it. And if you ensure that your threads are completely independent, then there's no need for handling any data dependencies that you have. Sometimes the thread may be dependent on each other if you're doing shared memory multi-programming, uh, multi-threading, but sometimes your threads may be completely independent, right? They may all be operating on different parts of an image, for example. That's why this is a very good model for GPUs. You partition your image, they're all different threads, and all the different threads go into the pipeline, and they all operate on different parts, and you know that they're completely independent of each other. Beautiful. That's why GPUs have been dramatically affected by this, and they operate with this, with this principle. Downside, of course, single thread performance suffers, because you're fetching one instruction into the pipeline every n cycles, where n is the depth of your pipeline. Okay. And also, you need extra logic for keeping thread context. Clearly, you need program counter and registers. And you do not overlap latency if not enough threads, if there are not enough threads to cover the whole pipeline. So this model works really well if there are enough threads to cover the pipeline, right? So we'll see an example of this in a little bit. Oh, okay, so a little bit, um, yeah, this is the idea, again, posed in a different way. Switch to another thread every cycle such that no two instructions from a thread are in the pipeline concurrently, right? We already said this, uh, and improves pipeline utilization by taking advantage of multiple threads. And this was actually a really old idea also. This was employed in the first out-of-order execution processor, CDC 6600, uh, except it was employed to overlap the latency of memory operations. So you could do a memory access, and the memory access takes 10 cycles, and you had a 10-cycle pipeline for that, and you finish, you start a memory access from one thread every cycle. So you need 10 threads to tolerate the latency of memory. So GPUs also use this to tolerate the latency of memory as well. And we will see that. And Burton Smith, uh, who just passed away recently, actually, unfortunately, developed a lot of these ideas and built a lot of machines uh, that, uh, mm, that operate based on these principles. Let's take a look at these very quickly. I already said this, uh, the CDC 6600, it has fine-grained multi-threaded pipelines. A processor executes a different I.O. thread every cycle such that you start a different memory access, they call these the I.O. threads, an operation from the same thread is executed every 10 cycles, right? And they, now you keep the pipeline full with different threads. There is no need for dependency checking. Is this memory operation dependent on the previous one? I don't care. Different threads feed the pipeline and they're all independent. Same here. 
there are 120 threads per processor. In this case, 120 thread context you can house in a single processor. GPUs are going to be very similar to this. Uh, and you have queues for available threads and unavailable threads. Some threads get out of the pipeline because they're waiting for data. Now you, you can fetch from other threads. Each thread can have only one instruction in the processor pipeline. Each thread is independent. To each thread, the processor just looks like a non-pipeline machine. Right? You're fetching an instruction every n cycles, basically. So there's a huge trade-off between system throughput versus single thread performance. So if you have only a single thread to execute, this is not going to buy you any performance. Yes? So they have, there are separate register files. I'll, I'll show you an example. So if you're fetching from thread zero, you, have, you go to the register file for thread zero. And that's the hardware cost. That's a good question. OK, so this is what the machine looks like. The cycle time was 100 nanoseconds. There were eight stages, so 800 nanoseconds to complete an instruction, assuming no memory access. And as you can see, there are these queues. Uh, let's start with this queue. So you fetch an instruction, you put the instruction to the queue, and there may be other threads that are waiting to be fetched. But the key is you fetch from uh, a different thread every cycle. Uh, okay, not this one. Sorry, you fetch the instruction, you fetch the operands. Uh, this is not that queue. There's another queue over here that's not shown. You fetch the operands, you perform the function, you store the result, and you go back to the queue to be fetched again. So threads are waiting over here to be fetched. When you remove a thread from the queue, it moves over here and cannot be fetched until it finishes the instruction over here. So threads are just moving. So for example, if, an is, if a thread requires uh, data from memory, it goes into this queue, waits for the memory, and then it gets out. And nothing is fetched from that thread because it, got far, uh, it, it was fetched from this queue, and it cannot be fetched again until that thread's instruction comes back and writes its result. It's beautiful, right? And you need 120 threads to tolerate the memory latencies that you have because the memory latency uh, can be long over here. But there is no need for control and data dependency checking, and it was developed by uh, this person, Burton Smith. He was a very good mentor of mine, actually, when I joined Microsoft Research. I had amazing conversations with him. He knew a lot about computer architecture and operating systems, but he passed away very recently. But he actually contributed a lot to the development of these ideas. OK, uh, so this is the example, to the answer to your question, basically. You have multiple program counters over here. And you have general purpose registers that are per thread. You fetch, and there's a thread selection logic, which we're not going to go into. Actually, exi existing processors are also very similar to this, except they don't employ fine-grain multi-threading. And uh, if you look at a super scale out of order processor, they employ multi-threading. But what they don't do is fine-grain. Fine-grain means every cycle you fetch from a different thread. If you do that on a general purpose machine, your single thread performance suffers. So existing processors look like this also. Uh, but not, not perfectly like this. But for fine-grained multi-threading, uh, you need separate register files, as you can see. And if you think about now 120 threads, you need 120 register files over here, which means that you have a mux. Right? Of course, you can be more intelligent in the design of this. OK, so Sun Niagara had similar principles. Uh, this was the, one of the first uh, multi-core machines. The idea was actually very simple, keep the pipeline simple, no data dependency check logic. If you look over here, it could fetch from four different threads. There's a thread select mux, four different buffers for instructions, and their thread select logic selects a thread depending on different things over here. And there's another thread select mux from the instruction buffers over here, and register file times four, as you can see, to uh, distinguish between different threads. And store buffers time four also. So actually, you need to multiply these per thread data structures by four in the machine. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of this? The big advantage is there's no need for dependency checking for anything within a single thread, right? Only one instruction in the pipeline from a single thread. No need for branch prediction logic as a result. We got rid of all of that complexity, right? And GPUs are beautiful because they don't have any of that branch prediction and dependency checking complexity. They have other complexities in the memory system. So otherwise, bubble cycles are used for executing useful instructions from different threads. This is looked another way. Otherwise, you would have a bubble. Well, why don't we execute instructions from different threads? You improve system throughput, you improve latency tolerance, and you improve utilization. It's beautiful. Disadvantages, extra hardware complexity, clearly, uh, and you reduce single thread performance. You should not do this if you're Intel, who is relying on general purpose performance of everywhere in the world, right? But you can do this if you start with a graphics engine 
because you already have many, many, many threads to begin with. And your processor becomes simple, and you get high system throughput, so you achieve. So based on your application, this has a lot of benefits or downsides. So of course, you have resource contention between caches and memory from different threads. You need to handle that somehow. I just experienced that resource contention at Tanambar. I was a thread, and there was a thread of 15 students, and they actually went just, just before me over there, so I got delayed behind, those, <laughs> behind that thread of 15 students, which is fine, but this is an example of resource contention, right? It could happen over here also. <laughs> uh, so, of course, if your threads are not independent, you still need to do some dependency checking uh, over here. So let me give you an overview of what's coming next. Modern GPUs are actually fine-grained multi-threaded machines. This is an early NVIDIA core. If you look over here, you have huge storage, a lot of registers for different thread contexts. Uh, and you can execute groups of 32 threads that share an instruction stream. Each group is called a warp. We will see that later. And they all execute the same instruct on different data. But the more important thing over here is up to 32 warps or thread groups well, thread group may not be a good name here. Thre uh, batch of threads can be interleaved in this fine-grained multi-thread manner. You fetch from one, in the next cycle you fetch from the next one. In the next cycle you fetch from the next one, dot, dot, dot. And in the end, you have a huge machine that has lots and lots and lots of threads that are interleaved this way in a fine-grained multi-thread manner. And that's the end of fine-grained multi-threading. If you would like to learn more, these are Burton Smith's papers, and they're beautiful papers. Okay, have a nice weekend, and I'll see you, I guess, next week, right? Okay, take care.